Hello and welcome to 39th lecture of video course on Travelogy. The title of the present lecture is General Bearing. We know bearings are required to support the load, particularly when there is a relative motion between components. When we are talking about general bearing, it is more like a, we are trying to support some cylindrical shaft and the applied load may be in radial direction. When we think about the general bearing, a rough picture appears something like this. There is a shaft or cylindrical object known as a general housing which will remain stationary, shaft is going to rotate. Some intermediate component which will be called bearing because housing can be treated as a bearing, but we want replacement. Housings are generally costlier. We will not be able to spare housing as a bearing. So, we use some intermediate component that is a bearing support. And if we want to reduce the wear, reduce the friction, we will try to use some lubricant that is oil uh, or uh, air or grease, some, some lubricant in that case. That is why some, there is a some clearance, so that we can accommodate that lubricant in this clearance space. And generally this clearance space is much lesser in dimension, maybe say 0.1 percent of the dimension of shaft, which is very, very low dimension. Then uh, there is a some side of the inlet, it may be we are using uh, oil, oil inlet, if we are using the grease, so there will be grease inlet, so that it can uh, replenish the lubricant which has been removed from the bearing ends. Housing may be split it also, so that assembly and disassembly of the bearing is easier. So, depends on the configuration, we can think of bearings in uh, obviously again we can classify bearings. If you want to see this as a split view or a better picture of this, we can think like this, we said there is oil inlet, there may be some oil reservoir also or continuous feeding of the oil. So, there is oil is uh, passing through this, this is a shaft surface, we try to keep shaft surface very smooth, particularly maybe the surface roughness may be lesser than 1 micron, 0 0.3, 0 0.2 micron, 0 0.4 microns. There is a housing and then this as a bearing over here, what sometimes we call as a bushing also, if it is a single piece, if it is a bearing two times or the splitted one then we will be calling the bearing. And uh, there is a nut and bolt connection, so to uh, or maybe if it is a threaded connection over here then we can use directly clamping this splitted portion with this portion. There is a other option also, we can provide a layer of solid lubricant. If we do not want to use liquid lubricant, greases and we do not want this kind of uh, oil reservoir, some passage like this, then we can think about the solid lubricants. But even in solid lubricants, we need to have a housing to restrict the motion of bearing. So, housing is essential, shaft is essential and bearing is essential and overall package, overall assembly can be known as a general bearing. If I do not uh, uh, use any liquid, semi liquid, then I can uh, say this is a dry bearing. Dry bearing may be a natural oxide layer on the surfaces or we can use a dry lubricant also, a solid lubricant. Those things can be used and we can uh, divide or we say classify general bearing as a dry general bearing. Then there is a possibility of hydrodynamic action. Shaft is rotating relative to the bearing. Because of this relative motion, there will be pumping action and due to pumping action, there will be levitation of the shaft and that will be known as a hydrodynamic general bearing. There is a possibility we supply lubricant with a pressure. Under pressure, this shaft will be levitated or will be displaced from the oil hole. In those situations, naturally, oil hole need to be from the bottom side. 
are from sides. So, that shaft can be levitated while in case of the hydrodynamic generally we are providing from the top. In hydrostatic it will be just reverse because we know wherever the shaft is going to touch the bearing surface their lubrication is required and we need to pump the lubricant to levitate the shaft. And one more lubrication mechanism that is a squeeze flow lubrication can be utilized with this configuration you can say the squeeze from journal bearing. So, journal bearing can be classified as a dry journal bearing, hydrodynamic journal bearing, hydrostatic journal bearing and squeeze from journal bearing. To give a better understanding this slide is showing some sort of sketches. I am assuming this red color circle is a shaft periphery outer surface and this black color circle as a bearing bow in the surface of the bearing. There is some clearance and this arrow is indicating the motion of shaft. This motion of shaft is continuously changing, if the center is continuously at a some distance from the bearing center and the distance is continuously changing with the time. So, that is going to give a squeeze flame action which we have discussed in fluid flame bearing topic. So, this is a known as a squeeze flame bearing shaft bearing clearance and liquid lubricant may be there. This is another sketch which shows there is a pump there is a pipeline and oil is getting pumped in this. So, there is an oil inlet there is a shaft surface there is a bearing because of the pumping action and pressure which is generated over this side shaft will be levitated. It will be in air obviously that it will not be touching the metal surface there will be complete suppression under pressure. Of course, when I use a complete suppression that means applied load is balanced it should not happen that applied uh, supplied pressure is much lesser than applied load and in naturally in that situation this uh, will not work uh, shaft will again touch the bearing surface. So, for an equilibrium point of view from design point of view we say that shaft will be levitated it will not touch the bearing surface because of this pressure and the pressure will be designed as per the requirement. So, this is hydrostatic bearing coming to the dry bearing you can see that this is a typical dry bearing split it so that it can be fitted in some journal or uh, it can be fitted in bearing housing and uh, journal will be supported on this. Now, there is a some sort of there are some sort of dimples on this. So, this bearing also can be utilized to store the lubricant if there is a some lubricant available and we are not supplying continuous lubricant flow or we are not providing continuous flow. In those situation this uh, kind of bearing can store the liquid lubricant for some time and uh, can survive give the lesser coefficient of friction. Again there is a hole so to supply oil in this or uh, there is a possibility that this hole can be used to fix the rotation or fix the degree of freedom of rotation of this bearing. So, it depends on the purpose this hole can be utilized and this will be known as a dry bearing. Finally, is a hydrodynamic general bearing that is a most popular reason being but this is known as a self acting bearing. Motion of the shaft itself is used as a pump we do not require external pump source that is main advantage of hydrodynamic bearing running cost will be lesser and in uh, overall view this uh, coefficient of friction will be even much lesser than rolling element bearing. However, there are some problems at the start and stop those need to be eliminated that is why many times we combine hydrostatic bearing with hydrodynamic action. We use a pump to feed the lubricant. So, the shaft is levitated and then allow shaft to rotate. So, the coefficient of friction is the laser valve within bounds 
much lesser than rolling element bearing. Running cost is also slightly higher than rolling element bearing, but bearing life will be much larger. And it can be designed to control the vibrations, which in rolling element bearing are very difficult. Vibration uh, damping in rolling element bearing is almost next to impossible, but this kind of bearing can eliminate all the vibration, it can give complete support, very good damping. So, this is a hydrodynamic bearing, we are able to see there is an oil inlet, there is a shaft rotation and as the oil flow uh, start coming in naturally there will be a tendency to flow this side as well as this side, but there is a rotation, there is a pumping action going to happen and there is a convergent uh, region. So, most of the oil will be dragged in towards this direction, again there is a possibility this oil, oil can go in this region, but this is a diversion and there is a possibility that pressure whatever the pressure was generated it has come to back to the atmospheric and there is no pumping action. From here to here the bearing may be starved one and without lubricant or may be lubricant without much pressure in that, but we call this, this is a cavitated zone. So, most of the action is happening over here, obviously we require a convergent gap for hydrodynamic general bearing to make it self acting. So, we can say the general bearing can be classified as a dry bearing like this, hydrodynamic bearing like this, hydrostatic like this where we require a pumping source, this is one of the costly bearing and a squeeze flow bearing which mostly happens because of the load action. A typical example is IC engine where the load is continuously changing and that is helping us to generate a lubrication mechanism. Now, start with the dry bearings, what we are going to see how to design these bearings and uh, there are again the red color circle and the black color circle, red color circle is indicating shaft surface, black color circle is indicating bearing bore and this arrow is showing the rotation. In this case rotation will not be a major problem for us either in clockwise or anti-clockwise. What is going to happen when there is a dry contact, metal to metal touch will be there or if there is a natural oxide on the surface, then those surfaces also will come in a contact. So, contact will be there and whenever there is a contact there will be wear and excess of friction naturally, whereas there is an excess of friction and a wear we need to think about the materials. Materials in those situations need to be carefully selected, however there will be high wear rate, lesser life and no use of using a travelogy. So, travelogy is essential from material selection point of view, we should choose proper material so that we can get desirable service from the bearing. When we talk about the material selection, naturally first choice comes on the friction, coefficient of friction need to be lesser. If coefficient of friction is a lesser, wear rate will be also lesser. That is uh, because of the direct contact, coefficient of friction is very high, there should not be any adhesion because that is going to give adhesive wear, there should not be too much abrasion, otherwise it will be abrasive wear. So, that is why we need good material. What we say coefficient of friction which is plotted on uh, y axis and uh, x axis obviously is showing the blocks of uh, metal, ceramic and glasses, polymers and composites. From friction point of view, I can say that this kind of a combination will be a better option. PTFE on PTFE, PTFE on steel, PTFE on ice, of course, ice we are, we are not going to use. So, we may be steel and PTFE. This combination is going to give better results from friction point of view and naturally there is a possibility less wear if the hardness is well contained. Always when you talk about the composites, we can think about the PTFE bronze or uh, uh, combinations, whatever uh, using with the fillers. PTF can be make it stronger. So, this combination also can be recommended from coefficient of friction point of view. And this figure is uh, clearly indicating when we talk about the full flame lubrication, coefficient of friction is much lesser. If I say 0.1 here, coefficient of friction here is a 0 0.001, almost 100 times lesser than this. So, hydrodynamic bearing will be always recommended when we require more reliable performance. 
but the cost of the assembly will be on higher side we require a bigger size while in case of the dry bearing we are not using any liquid lubricant no pumping source so overall system will be much lesser uh, we say in volume when uh, talk about the materials we say that uh, from this chart we are able to see the graphite on the steel is also good PTF is good obviously the most of the polymers are showing going to show the better performance either direct polymers or filled polymers using some sort of composites. So, polymers and uh, there is a possibility we can make about the porous materials the porous materials which have a some sort of void and uh, they can act as a good reservoir for the particles or uh, wear particles and uh, they keep overall surfaces under mild wear condition. Then uh, what is the problem? Can we really design this kind of bearings? There is a big question. Reason being in the dry condition coefficient of friction does not remain constant. If I plot and find out the standard deviation most of the time standard deviation is a more than 33 percent of mean value because we cannot rely on any coefficient of friction maybe one standard or maybe say in one situation coefficient of friction is 0.2 in next situation it may be 0.3 or maybe 0.1. So, there is a huge variation in coefficient of friction that is why most of the time we say that uh, this cannot be generalized cannot be scientifically generalized. So, what we require whatever the component we are choosing what is the material we are choosing at elementary level we will do the calculation but final it should be checked against experiments that is why we say that laboratory evaluation and field experience counts more compared to mathematical modeling of this system. We can choose empirical relation we can use empirical relations get the results, but do not rely completely on those results we need to fabricate that particular setup and test it or we directly apply those components and test now field test it that will give overall confidence and some more modification if it is required. So, we do not go ahead with this kind of dry bearing just based on the science just based on mathematical calculations we may take some sort of experimental uh, uh, scope or experimental um, methods or experimental test setups we use to find out what will be the best for the particular configuration. Now, when we talk about the material and importance of material for the dry bearing naturally the question comes what are the material properties how do we select proper material is there any definite property so I should look for that part of property yeah if it is we have a four important properties say maximum temperature PV limit maximum pressure and maximum speed it is interesting we are saying the PV limit and we are talking about independently pressure and V. So, this P and the V I can have a separate uh, thing, but a combination a product is also been as a material property or in other words when we are talking about the P when the velocity is 0, we are talking about the V when the pressure is 0. So, these two parameters will matter it will give some results uh, whether bearing is going to survive up to that pressure bearing is going to survive up to that velocity, but PV is also important because that is going to decide what will be the heat generation. Obviously, PV factor can be converted to heat generated uh, relation and that is going to say that whether bearing is going to be fine or soften or uh, will there be any microstructure change we say that whenever there is a heat generation then naturally the temperature will also come or we say heat dissipation capabilities. So, PV is one of the most important uh, parameter in this case because that is going to count what will be the coefficient of friction, what will be the maximum temperature and what will be the allowable pressure and velocity. That is why I say most of the time we use a PV limit or PV approach to design the dry pairing. In addition PV limit also can be related to the wear rate. Well, 
discuss this in uh, next few slides. While well, maximum temperature we know that is the limit of the softening or elastic limit will be converted to plastic limit or uh, if there is a softening of the material elastic limit will not be valid. So, in that, those situations we need to go ahead with the uh, temperature below that maximum temperature or operating temperature at any time need to be lesser than maximum allowable temperature. Otherwise, whatever the relation we use, whatever the design we use that will not be useful at elementary stage. However, if we require maximum temperature then maybe uh, we want to control it then maybe there is a possibility of external cooling we can think in that direction. So, what has been discussed? We require 4 material properties maximum temperature what is the maximum temperature which bearing can sustain PV limit what is the overall uh, maximum value of this product individual maximum pressure individual maximum speed and as I mentioned most important is a PV limit. We need to see what will be the maximum value bearing can sustain how we call it the BV approach. And if we see the couple of the table particularly we know the polymers and uh, um, sometimes the carbon graphite has been used as a dry bearing and because of the low coefficient of friction. Low coefficient of friction was a first choice and then now we are going out of the other material properties. And uh, I mentioned that um, coefficient of friction which is not a material property it is uh, more like a system property. Well, here the maximum temperature we can see the nylon is uh, one of the polymer PTFE fill PTFE alone cannot sustain very high temperature is generally a softer material. So, PTFE filled is a 250 degree centigrade and polycarbonate that is a 105 degree centigrade lesser than PTFE but um, may show the better performance phenolics and carbon graphite. We are able to see the carbon graphite has a distinctly very high temperature. Here we are talking about the 100 to 250 temperature while here we are talking about the 400 degree centigrade. Naturally, for high temperature application we should be able to utilize carbon graphite and it has a more advantage as compared to any other period. Talking about the PV limit that is a given in uh, mega Newton uh, per unit meter second. This is an island is going showing only the 0.9, but is a better than PTFE, is better and far better than polycarbonate, is better than phenolics. So, that is a showing a better result, even though my temperature point of view, nylon is showing the worst result in whole group, but it is showing the good results from a PV point of view, except. Uh, we said that high temperature this limit will continuously change right. So, that is why whatever we have application we need to see with a low temperature application we can think about the nylon as a first choice because PV is going to decide what will be the uh, bearing dimension. Now, coming to the pressure maximum pressure which it can sustain nylon is not able to sustain very high pressure. Now, while uh, carbon graphite uh, is also 0 0.4, 0 0.1 is the lower side, while uh, phenolic is uh, giving a best results in this. So, every uh, case a different material is giving results in case of uh, maximum temperature carbon graphite, in case of PV limit is a nylon, in case of uh, maximum pressure it is a phenolics which is giving the best result. While maximum velocity point of view again the two materials are giving the best result of phenolics and carbon graphite. So, this material table shows that whichever the requirement uh, we can decide or we can choose a proper material, but there is a problem. These materials have been tested in one lab may not give always the same results. There may be some fluctuation in these values because these values are depending like PTFE when we talk of the field one whether it is a glass field, whether it is a carbon field or any other material these properties will change. Naturally, whenever we are talking about carbon graphite how carbon graphite is been made that again will change the properties. So, it is not this material manufacturing process also plays an important role. So, we need to check the material uh, with a manufacturing process and maybe go through the catalog to choose proper values. This table has been shown just uh, to indicate how to choose a proper material. Maybe they when we have a temperature requirement we want to go for high temperature naturally there is a bunch option carbon graphite. 
when we want to go for the high PV limit naturally we have option of uh, nylon. When we talk about the maximum pressure and uh, lesser velocity then naturally we can talk about the phenolics. So, this is uh, what we are trying to convey, but again these are not 100 percent correct results may be tested in one lab. When we try to apply on a real object we need to see what materials are available and uh, we need to choose a proper table corresponding to that which have been uh, given by the manufacturer. Or we say that we can uh, think about the designing uh, dry bearing using PV approach. Some few lines on the PV approach, some description on the PV approach. We see the PV approach is a basically it gives a factor is the product and uh, this product has been decided so that we keep bearing wear within a mild domain. We can use Archard equation. If you cross this PV limit, still the bearing will survive, but not forever, maybe say few seconds, few minutes, few hours, but not longer time. Again, those that kind of life will be difficult to predict because it already cross a mild domain. That is why, from a mild domain point of view, this uh, PV uh, approach is need to be used. Uh, um, because uh, if we go across this PV limit, where it is going to increase drastically. When the wear rate is increasing, it may be because of the excess of thermal heating because a PV is uh, also using uh, energy dissipation capabilities of the material. That is why the, uh, it is different from uh, one material to other material, even the pressure and velocity we are giving, but this PV limit is different. And uh, there is a possibility of excess wear stresses. So, the stresses are going beyond the last trick limit naturally bearing will deform it will not be remaining in shape and it will turn out to be useless. So, we need to design bearing from PV limit point of view. I mentioned about that uh, PV can be converted in the wear rate or we say that this approach can be utilized to estimate the wear rate or mild wear rate. We know where we have studied the wear. So, volume of the wear can be given as a constant k. Uh, we can see use the word specific wear rate into applied load and distance travel it will product this. In this case the specific wear rate is also involving the hardness otherwise we use a separate k and divide by hardness, but for most of the polymer cases we use a specific wear rate more commonly. Now this relation can be given as a volume of the wear specific wear rate applied load W and distance of sliding. Now, if I assume the volume is product of depth of wear into area, I will say H into A and A can be brought on this denominator side. I will say W by A can be given as a P, right. I will just repeat it. We say volume can be given as a H into A and A can be transferred to this right at end sign. So, W by A will turn out to be P. D distance travel can be given as a velocity into time. So, that is why the D has been given as a velocity into time. P as a W by A load by area K remain as it is. So, this is going to give us a depth of wear a material. We have assumed that there is a uniform wear. This is uh, also involving PV factor. So, this PV permissible factor can be given. If it is a crossing some limit, naturally, this wear rate cannot be or this equation, this Archer equation cannot be used. So, this is why that the PV approach has been utilized and to find out okay, it is a well within limit and the H can be uh, figured out and we can estimate the bearing life. In addition as I mentioned that this is also uh, involving the heat dissipation capabilities what we can uh, relate to this we say that area for the heat flow can be given as a projected area I am assuming the bearing length L and diameter is a D. So, projected area will be L into D. Friction force we know very well that it can be given as a normal load into coefficient of friction and normal load can be uh, given uh, in terms of pressure into area. 
when you talk about the power loss, power loss can be given as a friction force into velocity. Now, what will happen? We say we try to find out energy dissipation, this is the power loss per unit area that is mu into w into velocity divided by area. So, this is energy dissipation area which is giving as a mu PV. So, again PV is related to energy dissipation, is related to the overall temperature rise. So, that is why the PV factor which has been uh, uh, given and a catalogs can be utilized to find out what will be the wear rate, it can be utilized also to find out what will be the energy dissipation or what will be the overall heat generation based on that with that again um, this is uh, related to the mu most of the time uh, coefficient of friction is not given in the catalog we that is why we relate only the PV we know if the PV is within the, within the limit even this energy dissipation will be within the limits that is why say so this is the indirectly whole design criteria PV pressure into velocity at any time it is not a maximum value of pressure it is not a value maximum value of velocity it is a product which is going to decide the design of bearing. Let us take an example, you see example says that the estimated wear rate or um, not wear only not rate in this case estimated wear of 10 mm long that length has been defined, material has been defined as a nylon, nylon bushing instead of bearing we are using the word bushing because that is a solid piece supporting a 10 mm shaft which has a weight of 5 kg. So, this is the dead weight of the shaft, no external load has been applied. So, that is a lightly loaded bearing and nylon bearing should give better results over here. So, 5 kg shaft which is running at the 900 rpm. If I know the shaft diameter, I know the rpm, we can find out what will be the relative velocity. Assuming this bushing is a having uh, fixed or is a it is fixed in a housing no relative velocity. No velocity is related to the housing, but naturally relative velocity relate, related to the uh, shaft will be there. Now, we do the calculation the only two formulas are required first is the V that is uh, so three formulas will be required first is the V, V is uh, pi d n divided by 60 because uh, uh, n is a given an rpm. So, we required a velocity in meter per second d is uh, mentioned to us that is a 10 mm diameter and pi we know is a 3.14. Now, p is a pressure can be calculated by normal force that normal force we are assuming the 5 kg that if you convert a newton it will be 5 into 9.81 so, that is a w divide by L into D that is the length of the bearing and diameter of bearing. We are assuming the shaft diameter is the same as the bearing bore diameter even though there will be clearance, but that will be in microns. When we talk about the 10 mm and we will say 10 micron clearance, we will not be able to think about 10.01 that is not going to change a significant results. That is why we use interchangeably whatever the dimension over here that will be can be utilized directly. We will not be worrying about 10.0 one it is not going to change a much result right. So, this is a what with variable list. So, pressure which has been calculated by using this formula is turning out to be around 0.49 mega Pascal. Similarly, velocity is turning out to be 0.47 meter per second. So, we can check that whether this is this product or uh, this parameters are well within limit or not for nylon. And we what we get for nylon, yes. Uh, pressure, permissible pressure is a 5 mega Pascal, and what we are getting 0.5 mega Pascal, 10 times lesser. So, that is right, we are able to see the right result. Coming to the velocity, this velocity is 0.47 meter per second, permissible 3 meter per second, so 6 times higher, no problem. From velocity point of view, it gives a clean sheet. From pressure point of view, it gives a clean sheet. Now, we talk about the product, it is a 0.49 into 0.47. Naturally, it will be lesser than 0.4, and permissible limit is 0.9. That is again from that point of view, this uh, product is fine. Obviously, the design of the bearing is fine, it can survive without much problem. The question comes how to estimate wear rate? This is say, okay, bearing is fine, it can survive the load there will not be excessive temperature rise, but will this bearing be able to survive 
of week r we are not estimating in linear rate. How to do that? So, we can use some formulation we say we know very well the wear can be given as a specific wear rate into normal load into distance travel. Distance travel can be given in terms of velocity into t. Velocity we know very well what is the value of velocity and uh, wear rate can be we say the v divided by t will give us a wear rate. Now, wear rate can be given as a specific wear rate into normal load into v. We know w, we know where v, the only unknown for us is a k. Again that is related to particular parameter or related to the condition in which it has been utilized. So, we can take a rough estimation from the bearing catalog. Naturally, we need to refer bearing catalog and we need to see what is a, this value for the nylon. And there is a table which shows wear factor, wear specific wear rate that is a 10 is to minus 15 in terms of 10 is to minus 15. It appears a very low number, but when we calculate it turn out to be a very high number. So, in nylon when we are using no filler and of course, in question nothing has been mentioned it says only nylon it does not say there is a filled or unfilled. So, we will should take this value. So, we say the k factor in our case will be taken as a 4 into 10 is to minus 15. There is other possibility if you use a filler in the nylon with the fillers maybe carbon uh, fillers with the glass fiber, uh, fillers depends or any material fillers that wear rate is turning out to be lesser. Again this will not be 100 percent correct because it depends on the filler the wear rate will change. Now, coefficient of friction also is there the coefficient of friction in the case of the nylon alone in this case very high hardness it is given as a 0 0.61 when it is a filled coefficient of friction is given as a 0.18. Again this values again cannot be directly used because uh, coefficient of friction is a system property is not individual material properties. However, it can give some guidance, but not final value for final value we need to iterate properly we need to manufacture and then we need to test in reality. There are some other material also PTFE poly polycarbonate polyurethane urethane that is uh, like in this case particularly wear factor for PTF is significantly high that is a 400 almost 100 times compared to nylon. Pure PTFE should not be used it should be always used with the fillers and that is says with the filler there is significant decrease in wear rate huge decrease in a wear rate. Talking the coefficient of friction here the penalty comes. PTFE is preferred from friction point of view, coefficient of friction is very low say the 0 0.05, but we make the mixture of uh, say when we are trying to fill it with uh, some sort of fillers some uh, long fibers then coefficient of friction is increasing almost at 2 times, but again if we compare decrease in a wear rate is much higher compared to increase in the coefficient of friction. So, we need to see the trade off if we uh, main application is only coefficient of friction we are not worrying of the wear rate then we can use a pure PTFE, but when we say overall balance overall in economics then we need to think about yeah filled PTFE. Similarly, we have other materials. So, for in our case we have uh, nylon we can think example of initially the no filler it is not filled completely or it is not filled at all and then this wear rate will turn out to be 4 into 10 is to minus 15 or uh, value of k will be 4 into 10 is to minus 15. Use that value in the relation which we derived in last slide. So, wear rate is given as a k into normal load into v. We know from this table this is specific wear rate is a 4 into 10 is to minus 15 apply load is a 5 kg. So, 5 into 9.81 Newton and velocity which we figure out from a previous slide is a 0 0.47, 0 0.4721 something, but just to make it rounding on the 0 0.47 that is a wear rate and this wear rate in mm cube per second is showing as a value of 9.22 10 to minus 14. How do we know that this wear rate is good? Uh, very high or see from this table we can say yeah this wear rate is very high compared to filled nylon, but in absolute sense when we are designing bearing we will not be able to figure out as it is. 
So let's take an example. We say that we want this bearing to survive for 1000 hours, 1000 operating hours. That is why we say if we want this bearing to survive for 1000 hours, what we are going to do? This multiply this uh, time 1000 hours into 60 minutes into 60 seconds. That is going to give us what will be the wear overall accumulated wear after 1000 hours. So, we will do that and you see the wear is uh, can be represented as 3.32 into 10 to minus 7 meter cube. Again, it is not going to give us complete indication whether that is fine for us or not. Should we recommend this kind of bearing design or we need to change material? It is not going to give a complete solution from here. So, we need to go ahead one step further, find out are we right or there is some mistake and we should change the material. For that purpose, we can think about a wear whether it is a uniform wear or not. So, this is a bearing shell shown which is the bearing bow and there is a, some thickness of the bearing. There is a possibility, there is a uniform wear. Almost every circumfer every point on a circumference is uh, experiencing the wear. So, there is a continuous uh, decrease in the thickness, regular thickness change. That is so why I say that this black color sign, sorry, this black color is turning out to be red color having a slightly um, lesser thickness in this case. So, it is a uniform, but there is a possibility that this portion is a worn out more compared to any other portion. There is a possibility, but in those situation we need to go ahead with the complete simulation and a dynamic simulation go at the time to time and you see the how point of context are continuously changing over the whole circumference and how wear it is going to change. But for time being we can assume there is a uniform wear. What is the meaning of that? say uniform wear over complete circumference or in other word we can say h into area. Area is a constant same area that is a projected area and h is a depth so, whatever the initial uh, bore diameter and this board, uh, uh, new bore diameter difference divided by 2 that will be the increase in uh, uh, or decrease in the thickness. The decrease in the thickness uh, is going to give us h. So, this will be same. 3.32 into 10 to minus 7 that is in a meter cube. So, we should change to the mm cube and that is uh, that is why the, this multiplication comes to 10 to 9 divided by area. We know the projected area is a 10 into 10, 10 mm is a length, 10 mm is a diameter. So, that projected area again we are not taking this decrement whatever the happening that is a decimal point we are not taking reason being that is not going to affect overall this is too significant level. There will be variation, there will be some delta variation in that, but we are not very much worried about that. So, for uh, this case uh, where it uh, yeah in this case a straightforward calculation there is a 3.32 10 to minus 7 10 to plus 9 of course, this is going to give a 10 to minus 9 10 to minus 2 from here. That is why this will turn out to be 10 to minus 9, this is 10 to plus 9, this will be cancelled out or overall wear weight will turn out to be 3.32 mm at the significantly high value. We have a bearing bow diameter 10 mm, there may be thickness of 5 mm, maybe 6 mm, 7 mm and out of that 3.3 where 2 mm where is going to wear out. So, that is a highly undesirable 10 mm. So, maybe say with that keeping a thickness of 5 mm or 6 mm and more than half of thickness has been removed. So, in that case impact loading will start, bearing will not be able to support the system. There will be completely a gen, uh, jump uh, uh, from one corner to other corner, bearing will turn out to be instable. Of course, not at the initial stage, but at the later stage. So, that is why the bearing need to be replaced much lesser than uh, 1000 hours. Maybe say even 10 hours, 20 hours, 20 hours, 30 hours, we need to find out what is the wear rate and how the vibration level is going to increase. Uh, other side, we can think about replacing this non filled nylon with a filled nylon. The wear rate in that situation is much lesser, that is a 0.24 compared to 4 almost 16 times difference and that is a case we can choose that kind of uh, material. We can do calculation you say the instead of uh, 3.32 where 
we are going to get only 0.2 mm wear rate, not wear rate, so depth of wear as a 0.2 mm, which is most of the case is acceptable. So, when we choose a bearing, we having this kind of uh, uh, wear constant of is a wear factor 0.24 bearing is going to survive 4000 hours without much problem. Yes, after that we should replace it because the depth of the wear has reached to 0.2 mm and it will start vibrating and there will be some sort of instability and wear rate may increase after that because the wear phenomena is going to change, wear rate may increase further. So, in that situation we say that uh, if we go through this kind of exercise, we can choose um, bearing properly that will be good for us. So, this is uh, uh, of course, uh, when we are talking about the fillers, uh, we can think about uh, number of uh, combinations the uh, glass fibers, graphite, molybdenum disulfide, some powder metal surfaces, not surfaces, the fibers we can be using those to the get a lesser wear rate from a nylon and that is important to make this kind of bearings. Now, we talk about the dry bearing and the one in similar category we can uh, keep porous bearings. What is a porous bearing? See, so, porous bearings are generally made of the powder. We were talking about the uh, non metallic uh, bearing as a dry bearing, non metallic, polymer is a non metal, carbon graphite is a non metal. No, we want to use a metal because that is a more popular, most commonly used materials. And mostly, uh, manufacturing processes are established, well established, well understood. So, we can think about the porous bearing. Why we are using the word pores? Because these bearings, bearing materials have generally the pores or voids and the percentage of the volume percentage of those voids may range from between 16 to 36 percent substantially high value. And how to make this? We are not going to manufacturing process just uh, an overview. So, that these uh, bearings can be made by pressing, pressing in a press so that it can be say that compressed. So, it is a pressed or compressed in dice, particularly shape, these bearing need to be compressed and done. Once it is done, naturally next process will be sintering, so that particles uh, they get engaged, make a one bulk material, it should not happen on always powder, powder form. So, that is why the sintering is essential, after sintering this powdered uh, metal will fuse and to then make a strong compact unit. As this material or this bearing materials have a pores, so when we sum much, we dip these materials in oil, what will happen? Oil will get absorbed in these materials and pores which are the 16 to 36 percent volume will be filled with oil. So, we are going to get advantage bearing filled with oil, we do not have to supply separately. And of course, uh, for final finish again we need to go ahead with the finishing operation to get the tolerance, close tolerance or whatever the tolerance we require so that we can maintain proper clearance. Now, this figure is going to give a comparison, we say in the one end bearing is initially rubbing bearing, allowable limit load is some W, allowable RPM maybe say some RPM. When you talk about the poorest one, and compared with the rubbing one, we are able to see the velocity limit is increasing, heat dissipation capability is also increased. Obviously, the area occupied by this curve is much lesser than area occupied by this curve. So, by making the bearing porous, we are able to provide better life, higher pressure limit, higher velocity limit or this will require lesser dimension over a lesser dimension compared to the dry bearing for the same life span. That is why the porous bearings are preferred in this situation whenever there is a restriction of oil supply we need a compact unit naturally we can go ahead with the porous metal bearings. Now, sometime we say that um, if I say the general sentence is the economic uh, benefit uh, of uh, porous bearing it is going to give a cost effectiveness, but when we go to market, we find porous bearing cost is higher than dry rubbing bearings. The question comes how, how we are saying these are the these bearings are the cost effective bearings. When we go to market, we buy this bearing at a higher price compared to the dry bearings or uh, compared to the 
uh, normal bearings. Even though we know the cost of the porous bearing is higher than cost of a normal or with a dry bearing or lubricated bearing, but when we compare, compare the cost of the bearing plus lubricant cost plus lubrication system cost that means the piping and the pump and all we find initial as well as the running cost is much lesser in porous bearings. So, if load is permitted, velocity is permitted, we should prefer porous bearing compared to other bearings. Reason being does not require much space, lesser volume, more compactness, lesser running cost, lesser initial cost for the overall system. That is why we say the bearings, if bearings are satisfactory for the application, then we should choose it. And these bearings are satisfactory for the light load applications and moderate speed, moderate light to moderate speed. They are not recommended for high speed, they are not recommended for medium and high wheel loads. Of course, these are the relative terms. For the nano scale or moderate scale, everything is a light load and uh, lesser than certain speed naturally we can uh, think about all porous bearing for the nano or micro level. Now, how these bearings are really operated? We say that in these bearings oil flows due to capillary action, there are small pores the length of the pore or the depth of the pore is much larger than the diameter naturally it will act as a capillary and due to this capillary action whatever the oil which is stored in the pores or in voids it will come out of that and it will be flowing on the surface. See oil flow due to the capillary action through pores in unloaded drumming. Naturally if the bearing is loaded it will apply opposite pressure will not allow the capillary tube to bring oil out. So, under pressure oil goes back and no load case only some oil will come out. It will not be a continuous supply if it is not been removed then flow will stop that is a simple fluid mechanics uh, thing we say that uh, it will reach to the surface, but if it is not wiped out from the surface further oil will not come. So, that is the overall uh, um, benefit of uh, porous bearing, they secrete the oil, they give the oil on the surface and if there is a shaft it can wipe it again some oil will come out and whatever the oil comes that can be go back or can be uh, redeposited in the bearing under pressure. So, under no load condition oil comes out on the surface and the load condition is goes back uh, in the bearing. So, restoring is happening. However, uh, the, we know very well that uh, this kind of bearings uh, again will be subjected to the friction slightly higher friction compared to uh, liquid lubricated bearing and lesser friction compared to the dry bearing. So, any heat dissipation capabilities need to be accounted or again in a short we can use the same PV approach which we have used uh, for the dry bearing for this uh, kind of application. So, this kind of uh, thing can be utilized or we say that it depends on if the oil which we have filled is a mineral oil then temperature uh, limit should come. Otherwise, if you are operating this kind of bearings for the high temperature application then we should account that for high temperature application and the metal is uh, supporting us then we should use some sort of synthetic oil which does not deteriorate with the temperature or uh, which has a high window viscosity index it does not change much performance. Uh, so, that we need to choose what is the application and how to select proper bearing for that. We will continue with uh, this uh, porous bearing uh, in our next lecture and after that we will try to start with the hydrostatic bearing in next lecture. Thanks, thanks for your attention.